not just by distress, but you know by a whole lot of other policies and a lot of other things, you know, and generally by human nature and how we can find middle ground and how we can uh, become more caring and unite for a common cause. The speakers we have today are uh, Dr. Akhtar Badshah. He's a distinguished practitioner and associate teaching faculty at University of Washington. He's also the founder and chief catalyst at Catalytic Innovators Group. Uh, he advises individuals and organizations to catalyze their social and philanthropic investments. He's also led Microsoft's philanthropic efforts for 10 years, where he administered the company's community investment and employee contributions. His new book, Purpose Mindset, How Microsoft Inspires Its Employees and Alumni to Change the World, has just been released. Our next is uh, Heidi. We've uh, made an introduction just to you yesterday, to all our uh, remaining panelists. So Heidi is the founder and CEO of Roots of Peace. He's done a lot of work in Afghanistan, fantastic work in Afghanistan. And uh, of course, you'll have, you'll have read it's from mines to mines and uh, all the agricultural work that she's doing there. So welcome, Heidi. <clears throat> we couldn't have you on the first uh, rehearsal that we had, but we'll take it from here. Okay. We also have uh, Kenneth with us. He is uh, the Salvation Army's national commander, leading a team of 5,000 officers, 84,000 soldiers, 43,000 employees, and over 3 million volunteers. He's an attorney by training. And uh, he left the practice of law in response to God's call. And over the course of his career, he's held appointments throughout the United States, in the UK, and in Kenya. So please welcome Ken. And we also have Mike, who is the CEO of C12, a global community of faith-driven CEOs and business owners who seek to build great businesses for a greater purpose. Uh, he serves nearly 3,000 members across three continents. And uh, C12 basically helps leaders achieve purpose across diverse industry, geography, and social contexts. He has a background in healthcare, collective impact, social innovation endeavors, management consulting, and enterprise sales. Uh, we'll dive straight into the topic. Akhtar, we'll begin with you. We're just going as um, chronologically, so we'll just begin with you. First of all, Shivaji, thank you very much. And I am so thrilled to be in this company. I mean, Heidi's work I've known for decades that she's been doing. The Salvation Army is, it's, it's there. It's with us all the time. You ring the bell. That's what you do. You ring the bell. And, and Mike and his work with, getting companies to discover purpose, I think just fits within what I'm going to say. And Shivaji, thank you very much for moderating this session. I think we are living in extraordinary times. Mm. And this past year has kind of given us or highlighted in us both the very good and some of the challenges that we have faced as a society. I wrote the book Purpose Mindset with the intention of getting individuals to look at how you move from the focus on the individual to the focus on the we and the collective. Heidi's work, the Salvation Army, C12, they're all kind of focused on the same notion of how do we think about the common good and what does it take for an individual to move beyond the growth mindset, which is what we have constantly focused on, especially in the business world, where the focus is on self-growth, which is good, business growth, which is also good, but it is a closed loop in a closed circle. Purpose and purpose mindset is all about introducing the community into the growth that happens within you 
and within your company. And I describe five principles of purpose mindset. The first, we all have strengths and work from your strengths. Second, put on the lens of abundance and find resources where they might be. Third, do not focus on efficiency, but instead focus on effectiveness. It is the impact of the work that you do that counts. Mm. It's about building movements. Mm. It's going from moments into movements and not organizations. And finally, it is about discovering empathy and compassion, which then leads to purpose. Purpose is that renewable source of energy that drives us forward and humanity forward. And I believe that is what is the middle way where we bridge across cultures, we bridge across communities, we bridge across race, we bridge across religion, we bridge across political divides so that we as a nation, as a world, as humanity, continue to put our best for face forward, our best foot forward, and the work that Salvation Army does, the work that Heidi is doing for Roots for Peace, is all about that transformation that takes place within ourselves so that we can contribute for a better future. So let me stop there, Shivaji. Thanks, thanks so much, Akhtar. Uh, we'll, we'll come to you with more questions. First, we'll get uh, all of you to have your say. Heidi, uh, you can please welcome to the panel and you can begin yours. Thank you so much. Well, I'm so honored to be included on this distinguished panel. And uh, as I research all of your backgrounds and your pathway to the middle way, I can only think of the words of my grandmother, Coincidence is a miracle in which God prefers to remain anonymous. There are no accidents. And I think this is such a rich and diverse and, and very timely uh, conversation to be had. And I thank Frank uh, Jürgen Richter for uh, engaging this with the Harassus group. Roots of Peace began in September of 1997 with a vision of turning mines to vines, replacing the scourge of landmines with bountiful vineyards and orchards worldwide. I'm a mother of four children, and I had just nothing but an idea that I was armed with. But it was three weeks after the tragic death of the Princess Diana, and um, she catapulted the issue of landmines to the forefront of the international agenda. And when I learned that we live in a world today with an estimated 60 million landmines silently poised in 60 countries, I thought that doesn't possibly align itself with the parable of the seed. And to remove these deadly seeds of terror and to plant ag sustainable agricultural redevelopment became my life's journey. And along with my husband, who was just my tech director here, um, uh, you know, it really was an incredible journey. He was uh, 10 years IBM and uh, with John Warnock and Chuck Geschke helped pioneer um, uh, something called Acrobat. It was how to collect, you know, connect to completely far apart places and a tight rope to walk. And uh, that's when they named it Acrobat. I happened to be at the table. So, so, you know, this is what we do today, much like that on a tight rope. And, you know, with, with a vision and, and tenacity, I think as human beings, we can achieve far more than we could ever imagine in our wildest dreams. Uh, Roots of Peace today has planted rice in Cambodia, grapes in Afghanistan, orchards in Croatia, wheat in Iraq, and in the Holy Land, uh, working with both Benjamin Netanyahu and going over the border, the fence, whatever you want to call it, meeting with uh, Mahmoud Abbas, Roots of Peace, and working with a little 10-year-old boy who stepped on a landmine, helped bring forth the first humanitarian mine action legislation to demine the fields of Bethlehem, four miles from where Jesus Christ was born in a Muslim village governed by Israel. 
So, so as to me, uh, the work we have done after the tragic um, uh, 9-11 attacks, many people don't realize that this year marks the 20th anniversary of 9-11, and people feel a sense of apathy. What, what has been done? But Roots of Peace has gone in there with funding from USAID, DOD, European Union, Asian Development Bank, and on a pioneer spirit, we planted 5 million fruit trees in all 34 provinces and provided exports to new markets to India, Pakistan, Delhi, Dubai, and impacted over 1 million farmers and families. And we're just getting started. It, you know, we've had many obstacles along the way. Um, uh, in March 28th, uh, 2014, we were tragically attacked by the Taliban in a four and a half hour gun battle were the mm -hmm. worst hours of my life. And it was a defining moment for me as a California mother to realize, has this just gotten too, too dangerous? And when my first grandchild was born, I looked into his eyes and I thought, to whom much has been given, much is expected. And so we went forth and with our, our uh, CHAMP program, Commercial Horticultural Agricultural Marketing Program. We helped bring agricultural exports from 2014 from 250 million to over $1.4 billion today. And uh, this is a spring like never before. It's uh, a time to plant. And, and as we gear up towards the end of this year, I am hoping that we can show the world the middle way, a harvest of hope on former war-torn lands. And as we literally take that vision that began in my heart, um, you know, uh, 24 years ago this year of turning mines to vines, blood into wine, killing fields into vineyards. And in the case of Afghanistan, these grapes will never be fermented with due respect to the Muslim culture. But as we've seen uh, recently with an incredible uh, voyage of, of uh, Pope Francis to meet with the Grand Ayatollah in Iran. There is fertile grounds for peace among human beings. I was diagnosed with COVID-19 in November. It went into double pneumonia and I know the feeling of being in a hospital without my family, without my children. And it was a defining moment for me once again, how important my footsteps for peace are so as we emerge from this world of COVID-19, let us, let us grow forth with compassion and understanding across all borders. For, for when the vaccines are, are, are given to people around the world, there still remains 60 million landmines where people must shelter in place throughout the world. And I hope we can emerge with a sense of empathy and understanding for the eradication of landmines and the planting of the roots. Film.com, and it's a story of a Prince of, of Pope Francis calling forth compassion, humanity, climate change, refugee repatriation, uh, uh, gender equality, and I think it transcends borders. I think it's something we should all um, watch, and you know, whatever our paths to the divine, realize that we are one humanity, and um, and. Uh, just dig deeper for peace. So thank you again for the honor of uh, presenting this evening. Thank you so much, Heidi. It was a lovely, lovely talk. Uh, Kenneth, we will have you next. Thanks very much, Shivaji. It's a great pleasure to be a part of this distinguished panel this evening. Uh, I am already uh, uh, deeply impressed by what I have heard. I want to make particular reference, if I may, as we begin our time together, uh, to the title of this session, The Middle Way. That, of course, echoes the notion of via media, the notion of no extremes in anything. It began with Aristotle, then through Greek philosophy, uh, all the way down through history. Well, I think that's important for us to keep in mind tonight, because what we're talking about is bringing people together from different extremes into something that is going to represent not simply compromise, but unity. I uh, recently read a book uh, that talked about something that Akhtar mentioned a moment ago, and that is 
the I, we, I paradigm, the notion that American society has come a long way in the last 100 years. It's a book by Dr. Robert Putnam and Shailen Romney Garrett called The Upswing. And it talks about the fact that we find ourselves today in America in a situation similar to that which America found itself during the Gilded Age. Gross economic inequality, political polarization, cultural fragmentation, uh, social isolation. And they trace American history and the events of American history from that period up through World War I, the Depression, World War II, uh, the turmoil of the 60s, the 70s, 80s, down to today. Their analysis of those four areas suggests that we are now in a position where we could anticipate, if we plan for it, an upswing, an upswing back toward a we society. Their answer as to how that's going to take place is not technological. Their answer is not based upon uh, uh, AI. It's not based upon economic patterns. It's not even based upon the appearance or the role of leaders across the world. Their answer to how that will take place is individual moral decisions leading to cultural transformation. If therefore, we're going to talk about bringing people together from extremes to a middle way, to a via media, to something that will allow us as a species to move forward, I think we have to keep in mind that we're going to have to constantly evaluate are we coming together? Are we doing those things that will create a we society? I think there are primarily two ways that we can move in that direction. When my wife and I uh, entered our first command appointment at a small Salvation Army facility in Southern California, uh, we were in a poor building in a gang infested area Lots of graffiti on all of the buildings around us. But there was no graffiti on the Salvation Army's building. We soon learned that the reason for that was that the Salvation Army's facility was considered neutral ground. Everyone would come together to that place to play basketball on a Friday night. And while they were there, it was understood they would not have a gang affiliation. That was a place where those young men primarily, could find acceptance and love and freedom from fear in a way that was very special to them. And they honored it and respected it. I'd like to think that creating neutral grounds of that type in different places across society is going to be one of the keys to achieving the kind of via media that we're looking for. But there's another element. Not only is it an opportunity for, an accept, for acceptance, but I think via media also raises the notion that we rely upon one another. Some years later, my wife and I were appointed, as you've already mentioned, to Kenya, where we served for eight years. For four of those years, we were in a small Kenyan town near the Ugandan border called Kakamega. Now, Kenyan society is still highly tribalistic. And not only is it tribalistic with 47 tribes, but there are a multitude of sub-tribes and clans, and they do not work well together in many cases. That was certainly true where we were in Kenya. But what we learned over the course of our time there was that notwithstanding the divisions that existed between the clans and between the tribes, when a member of the community had a need, the entire community would come together to help. This was particularly evident during funerals. Funerals are intended to be large community celebrations in Kenya, but no one can afford to pay the bill. So when someone dies, a family member will take responsibility to go into the community and to obtain subscriptions in order for everyone to contribute to the cost of the funeral. And when someone else in another tribe dies a few months later, they'll do the very same thing for him. There is therefore a need that individuals have for one another, which reinforces this notion that they're going to come together. 
Over the course of the last year, the COVID pandemic has revealed what I think is a unique moment that can bring both of these trends together. First, in terms of an opportunity, we've come together with an understanding of the fact that we uh, uh, are looking for uh, uh, something other than the isolation that we would otherwise have. We're looking for acceptance. It's an opportunity to renew our relationships at home. It's an opportunity for us to reevaluate what is really important to us. And at the same time, we've recognized that we have a need to rely upon one another. No one individual is going to solve this. It's going to be communities working together. Rahm Emanuel said on one occasion that you should never let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> and I would like to believe that what we have seen in COVID presents an opportunity for us to really find that middle way, that via media. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you so much. It's wonderful. Uh, Mike, can we have you on uh, next? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start with maybe three quotes by some leaders I respect. Uh, Martin Luther King said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. But he goes on to say, we're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. And whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly, which I think resonates with much what's sort of been shared by my uh, distinguished peers. And I'm, I'm big fans of uh, Brian Stevenson's work with the Equal Justice Initiative and uh, the great social work pioneer, Brene Brown, that it's, it's difficult to hate up close and it's impossible to love from far away. And so this idea of proximity is key. And then I'd like to offer, as a, as a person, as a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, there's this a Jewish man who grew up in Syria who wrote a letter to a bunch of Greeks and Romans who were trying to deal with a, a multi-ethnic community and all sorts of geopolitical and economic struggles. And he wrote this to them. He said, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bear with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And then he goes on to speak about this, this kind of beautiful life that could be had. But he kind of, in his uh, exhortation, also identifies the biggest threats to all this. It's a lack of humility. So it's pride. It's a lack of gentleness. It's harshness mm -hmm. hatred. And it's impatience. And if we can uh, reject those that embrace others, there's a chance to do something quite different. So I'm going to follow up my, my friend from the Salvation Army who, who broke out via media. I also, when I heard the middle way and the topic for this panel, I initially thought of a, a Latin phrase also called tertium quid, which has been similarly used as a tool throughout all sorts of debates. When good people found themselves wrestling with A or B to the point that it was destroying community. And sometimes it was over things that just seemed like both answers were inadequate. So uh, Christians argued over the, the person of Jesus, whether he was divine or human. And, there's been debates on all sorts of answers. Thomas Jefferson, since we're talking about the American continent right now, about 150 years ago, made a pretty insightful prophecy. He said, if the American experiment of, democ of a democratic republic is to be eventually defined by two competing powers, two parties, they will shear the country apart as they each vie for just enough dominance to advance their agenda at the expense of the others. And so he created a political party that only exists in the Virginia Commonwealth today called the Quid Party. But his, his intent was there needed to be a destabilizing third factor to, to bring concession, to bring compromise and mutuality back to the table. And I think we're, we're seeing that this us-them polarity right now is really distressing. I, I think there's um, a critical need to, to inject into the ethos of, of the American and global human dialogue, this idea that tolerance is a two-way street mm. and that we can have disagreement without having discrimination. Yeah. And there's this uh, tendency towards centered sets where we are defined by our agreement and your disagreement then makes you not one of us versus around centered sets where you go, well, we can agree on women, children, immigrants, war victims, refugees, hunger, health. And COVID-19, in, in many ways, is an energy moment because we all were suffering the same thing. No one was exempt. Some were more resourced. Some were more advantaged. 
but we were all suddenly exposed to a, a shared enemy, a shared threat, which for a moment reminded us that while we have our little bounded sets, we're in a centered set of the place we live and who we are. And I hope we do grab a hold of that and do something with it. I think the um, the danger is I'm a big believer in the power of, of love and purpose and identity and coming together around uh, with collective impact around shared interests. But I also know that that's not natural, that uh, death is natural, decay is natural, entropy is natural, love is supernatural, it requires diligent cultivation, it requires you know, gardening, it requires scaffolding and irrigation and care to help things fulfill their potential. Left to their own devices, it never fully gets realized. So I'd say some points I'd love to put on the table as we open up the panel is I think we need to foster and encourage uh, proximity and dialogue appreciating differences without denying them and raising a, a robust definition of tolerance that actually supports mutual liberties. I think we need to embrace this idea of creating centered sets that actually force people who radically disagree on so many things to come together on what thing they can agree on. And in the context of that relationship, find it harder to hate, easier to love, and to build from there. I think we need to celebrate better narratives. We're in, a, in an era where the Narratives are celebrated at the worst extremes, mm-hmm. and the the great examples rarely get as much airtime. I've worked with all sorts of uh, agencies and, and print companies who have refused to publish good stories because bad news sells, but bad news infects the, the mental consciousness of, of our world with a belief in the bad and a lack of hope. And I think there's more good up there. And then I think if we can, um, if we can read politically kind of raise, I'd love to see a, another simple thing. I wish we had a higher majority vote rule in most political decisions that forced better collaboration and compromise among differing parties. So I think it would bring out humanity versus competitiveness. So those are just a few uh, principal ideas around this idea of tertium quid, the need to, to reject a, a dichotomy of A and B that's going to shear our, our society. And I think there's a great opportunity in this moment of history to model a different way, a middle way. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, any questions regarding uh, any questions from any of the panelists regarding the other panelists' work or anything that you would like to know? Could I ask Shivaji? Uh, and this uh, this is for all the panelists. All of us are making reference to concepts beyond the material. Correct. Uh, what what do the panelists see as the role of faith uh, and of religious belief in order to achieve some of the things that we're talking about? There can be a, many different views on this. I'm wondering what the panelists feel that uh, might be the role of faith, religion. Obviously, uh, I share with Mike a faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, but I also know that uh, Heidi will have experience working with those of the Muslim faith uh, in the Middle East. Uh, other faiths and other parts of the world can play a part in this. I guess my question is, how do we mobilize that for the purposes that we're talking about today? Akhtar, would you like to go first? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think... Faith is critical. I, I mean, faith in humanity means acceptance of all religious beliefs. I'm a Muslim, but that doesn't make me different from you, Kenneth, or Heidi, who has worked in the Muslim world Mm -hmm. for decades. Yes. So faith to me is, so when you talk about purpose, you talk about faith. Mm -hmm. And when we go to the collective, we talk about faith. I mean, as you pointed out, Kenneth, there has been a long history in this country of having the common good being the focus. Right. Whether it is self-governance, small groups of people governing for themselves, 
And so I believe that faith is critical. Now, religion and leaders of religion, I believe, are extremely important to talk about what we have just discussed, mm. which is moving away from individualism and to think about how we can operate at a different level, which is not just material gain. Unfortunately, our individual gain got associated with material gain. It was never supposed to be that. Hmm. Right? Individual gain was also supposed to be spirituality. Individual discovery of self and spirituality. So I believe that it is faith plays a critical role if we are to discover the middle way. Hmm. And, and I, there's a... Um professor of religion at Boston University years ago wrote a book called God is Not One. His name is Stephen Prothero. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that, he made a, a, a this is back almost 20 years ago, and he, he made an interesting forecast. He said, in our fear of acknowledging differences of faith, we, in minimizing them, we actually right. breed ignorance and brutalness <clears throat> because yeah. the that's such a part of who we are that if you try to ignore faith, you actually, I think you actually breed schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. um, it's why you begin seeing good people do bad things because we've actually encouraged this compartmentalization of identity, which just creates dysfunction in people. And rat, I don't think the key to a third way is ignorance or the dismissal of difference. I think it's actually the embracing of, of constructive dialogue, appreciation of those differences. And, uh, and I think one of the things that's led to this whole question around in the corporate world, so I work with thousands of businesses all around the world who have a faith as a CEO or owner, businesses are widely diverse. But one of the issues you see with this whole issue of corporate consciousness and greed and corruption is, is if you disconnect one's identity and values from their vocation, their community life, you should expect bad things. Mm -hmm. uh, we are integrous beings. And so I think the, the role of, Faith is, is one of the great hopes for bringing values that are necessary to uh, to edify and to prevent corruption and to prevent the very kind of evils that we see so much of. So, <clears throat> some comments to your question. Mm -hmm. And and I have a comment. <laughs> I mean, this is just so touching because I didn't expect to talk about faith and religion when we're talking the middle way. But to me, it's the only way. And. Um, I, I just recently wrote a book and it was published when uh, COVID-19 when all bookstores were closed. But when my editor at Simon & Schuster saw that I was writing about faith in a book that is talking about what I do and, and, and I manage over for the past two decades, over 200 million in contracts. And they said, if you talk about faith, you're, you're, you're going to lose your funding. You know, they'll, they'll think you're from that left coast, you know, and, <laughs> And I said, well, it, it, if I don't write it from faith, I, it's not my story. So I told my true story. And, and it was astonishing to me that Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, the CEO in Afghanistan, read the book. And my faith in, in, as a Catholic mother in the Blessed Mother Mary, he said, we too in the Holy Quran honor the Blessed Mother Mary. I would like to launch your book from the palace. And this past fall, he launched Breaking Ground from Kabul, Afghanistan. And I, I think that all I can say is we have to be true to our roots. We have to be true to who we are. And, and for me, taking an idea and, and turning it into reality on the other side of the world is like the tiniest grain of a mustard seed growing forth into the kingdom of heaven. And if I think it's about me, you have to check your ego at the door. Um, you know, I love that quote by Sir Isaac Newton, for if I have seen further than others, it is only because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. But um, uh, I'm, I'm so inspired by your various quotes. And I'd like to give um, share a quote uh, from John F. Kennedy, President John F. Kennedy, only a few months before his death. It says, so let us not be blind to our differences 
but let us also direct attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. For in the final analysis, our most common link is that we all inhabit the same small planet, we all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's future, and in the end, we're all mortal. So I think we're just all blessed to be on this panel to share our truth and our various paths to the divine, whether we're Christians, Jews, Muslims, or in the case where I work in Vietnam, just people with good hearts. But I think we need to celebrate the seeds we have in common rather than those which separate us. And I think if we get this type of voice out to the world, I think there's more people that will understand it than, 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 than we choose to fear. Mm -hmm. Very good. Ken, what, what are your thoughts on this? I was just going to ask. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> well, uh, I think that my highest identity is not as an American. It's not as a, as a man. Uh, it's as a follower of Jesus Christ. And if I define myself in those terms then I, I feel an enormous sense of freedom uh, in that uh, the categorizations that human beings are wont to impose upon others fade away because now the emphasis is not upon how others might define me, but how I'm defined in relationship to my Lord. Uh, I, I find it absolutely critical. So I find it tremendously freeing but I also find that it imposes upon me a higher responsibility than anyone else ever could because knowing what I know about how God loves me not only motivates me, but obligates me to live in a way that's going to glorify him. And I think that if people take their faith seriously, uh, whether it's the, the Muslim faith, the Hindu faith, the Christian faith, if they take their faith seriously, I think the practical result of that in the world is going to be what Mike has already mentioned, a lot more tolerance, a lot more conversation, uh, and a lot more peace. So that, that's why I, I agree with all of you. I think faith is absolutely vital. And indeed, uh, for me at least, it would be the number one factor uh, if the world, and not to mention this country, is going to move forward. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's so important. And I have learned so much in working in Afghanistan. And I've learned about Mohammed. I, I, we need to know and understand and, yeah. and learn more about other cultures. Because, uh, you know, if um, it, it, it's ignorance in, in, in not understanding. And again, I want to emphasize that my organization is apolitical, humanitarian, uh, interfaith. And, and it's not, um, I want to be very clear about that with Roots of Peace, but my book and my story is is my journey. And uh, it's never meant to be imposed upon someone else. It just, just being truthful to to my roots. And and I think, um, you know, when you just step on a landmine, it doesn't matter, you know, who, who steps on it. Um, and, and I think when a seed is planted, it doesn't matter the color of our hand, the faith mm -hmm. in our hearts or the politics in our mind. But when you remove those seeds of hatred, you have to fill it with love and, and uh, in the mind, body and, and spirit from soil to soul. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We have, uh, we have one uh, question from uh, Jim Wan, who is attending this panel. Uh, he asks, you know, what are some realistic and uh, incentivizing mechanisms in an age of growing social media echo chambers and good versus bad narratives that cater to specific audiences that can allow one side to step into the shoes of the other side and see different perspectives? Mm. So I, I may just talk about it and, you know, my my also talk about it from the same perspective that I think that a workplace can become that ground, that middle ground where if companies allow for people of different disciplines, different opinions, different virtues, different beliefs to come together around a common cause around their communities, now you start breaking down these barriers 
But more importantly, you are actually building the muscle in people to be able to talk across differences. And I believe that the workplace is where this starts. And that's where I talk about as to what Microsoft was able to accomplish by creating this space where people could bring, set aside their differences because there was something larger they were focused on and it was not just work. Mm. Mike? Yeah, I, well, I appreciate my, uh, my brother from Seattle there. I think um, we need forums where I, I think the tendency, I've got, I've got young children and they're usually best of friends, but every once in a while they're suddenly worst of enemies. <laughs> <laughs> and when they, in those rare moments where they suddenly erupt in selfishness, usually over something so small and petty, they often want to run away from each other and put me in the middle and put my wife in the middle. And we generally, you know, if there's not physical harm or danger, saying, you got to go back and deal with this. Like, we can help you, but you got to talk to each other. Um, and we need things that push people back together. And I think the danger of, um, in social media settings and, and the free in communication channels. If we if we try to deal with the animosity by censoring speech, by controlling messaging, by eliminating those we disagree with, to your point, Jim, you made a great point, we end up in an echo chamber of our own thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working for a company and I was doing a, a, a Bible study before work with some peers who we were studying the, the words of Jesus and an employee filed a complaint. If you happen to be a Jewish man and he told HR that he felt it was creating a, a discriminatory environment that I was allowed to have this meeting on, on the company campus. So they called me in and said, Mike, we probably need you to stop doing this. And I said, well, wait a minute, why don't we invite him to do a Torah study? In fact, he can use the space I was meeting, we'll move. Um, and so they brought the man in and said, hey, Mike said instead of him stopping talking about his faith, what if you had a conversation about your faith? And he said, okay, well, I want the room Mike uses. And they said, Mike already volunteered it. And uh, he said, okay, that, that'd be good. And I said, I have a request. Can I come to your Torah study? And he said, no, no, no Gentiles. <laughs> and, uh, and I went, well, that's, that's discriminatory. You're welcome in my group. And he said, well, no proselytizing, no arguing. And I said, no, I, I want to come and learn. Honestly, I have never studied the Jewish faith from a Jewish leader. I probably have ignorance I don't even know. And so the next year, we ended in this relationship that initially was a bit of posturing, but by the end of it, we were genuine friends. Yeah, wonderful. And we need more of those things in workplaces. Schools and workplaces are exactly. two of the biggest areas where there's something that forces people to exchange in a system that is not their family system, not their ideological or political system. And I think we do need to raise the idea that you don't need to hide who you are. Right. But we need to force what, what dignity and respect looks like. And dignity and respect comes from actually appreciating our differences, not ignoring them mm. and not censoring them. And so mm. I don't know how you incentivize it. J Jim, you asked a tough question. That's, I think we have to champion it. And then here's what I found. I found that the businesses that do that well, people of wildly different backgrounds want to work there. Exactly. I, I, had a, uh, yeah. I, had, I know a CEO of a, a business out east where, because they actually get to disagree and still feel loved. And that's a really cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to elevate those and then let those institutions outperform. Let free market will reward the communities, the environments, the systems that people actually feel safe in. Yeah. Great. Uh, that's actually all the time we've got. We've got two minutes. I would like to hear your opinions as well, but you know, I know it'll be cut short in the middle. So thank you so much, Akhtar. Thank you so much, Heidi. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Thank you so much, Mike. It was a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Uh, we'll be in touch. And it was great. It was really a very, very interesting panel. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you so much, everybody. I hope we keep in touch. Yes. Yes. Sure. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye.
Bye-bye.